Okay, aloha everybody. Um, I'm Brad Romine, I'm the Deputy Consortium Director with the Pacific Islands Climate Adaptation Science Center. I'm also extension faculty with Hawaii Sea Grant here at the University of Hawaii Manoa. Um, so our next panel will be our partners panel, we're calling it. Um, this will be focused on federal university relationships in climate adaptation research and science in Hawaii and the Pacific Islands. The goal of this panel is to highlight the resources and capabilities of PICASC and some of our partner organizations for addressing climate adaptation science needs in Hawaii and the U.S. affiliated Pacific Islands. Our discussion format will be very similar to the last one. Um, each panelist will take about five minutes to provide some opening remarks, um, including describing their organization's science foci, priorities and efforts. Um, this will be followed by a moderated question and answer session with the panel. Uh, we encourage the audience again to submit their questions and comments for the panel through the webinar uh, question and answer function. So with that, I will introduce our first speaker, um, Dr. Mary Vaughn Johnson, who you've already met earlier in our webinar today, but I'll give you a little deeper introduction to Mary Vaughn. Um, before becoming the federal director for PICAST, Mary Vaughn had many years experience in international diplomacy, multifunctional land use solutions, and policy impact assessment. Working for numerous government entities on projects from the USGS Palila Restoration Project, the State Department's Lower Mekong Initiative, to the USDA's Conservation Efforts Assessments Project, including PICAST. Um, all, including PICAST, have a common thread of addressing stakeholder concerns through collaborative, complementary efforts at all levels, from government to local. Go ahead, Mary Vaughn. Thank you. Hello again. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to those of us who are still with us. <laughs> My name, as Brad has just so kindly introduced, is Mary Vaughn Johnson. It's good to talk to you again. As Brad just noted, and as I mentioned earlier, I'm the federal director of PICASC. And as I noted earlier, our program is built upon relationships. So PICASC is a part of the United States Geological Survey, or the USGS. The USGS is the sole science agency for the Department of the Interior. And the USGS works with partners across the nation and around the world to collect data, to monitor data, to analyze and to provide scientific understanding of natural resource conditions, issues, and problems. Some people think of us as a, as a soil mapping agency, but we, uh, we clearly, I'm sure you're aware, do a lot more than that. Um, as you probably do know, the USGS has many scientists working throughout the Pacific, uh, working on a broad variety of backgrounds, working with a broad variety of interagency partners, um, working with many of you who join us today. During the lightning talks, uh, which will occur after this session and throughout tomorrow, you will learn from a number of scientists and managers who work with PICAST and who often are also interfacing with scientists from the centers that I have put on this slide. PICASC has funded scientists from each of the centers that you see here. The ones that I have put in blue are centers that have offices located um, in Hawaii, but the others have scientists who are acting throughout the region, including the Fort Collins Science Center, which has um, an office on Guam working on brown tree snakes. I put up this slide really to, to emphasize to you that um, these people who are co-located with us and those who are on the continent are more than happy to bring their expertise to our region. So I wanted to share with you the diversity of the USGS collaborators that we have at our fingertips, people who are really interested in coming to commit their science to the Pacific. In fact, these, as I mentioned, are the centers that we have funded um, scientists to work with us. There are in fact even more USGS science centers throughout the continent um, on whom we could draw, um, with whom we could collaborate if we wanted to grow our enterprise to explore other climate change related challenges that unfortunately we do anticipate arising. So as climate change impacts continue to mount, we anticipate that we will face more multifaceted cross-sectoral challenges that will require complex collaborations and inputs from scientists with various expertise. So 
we really are lucky to be able to pull from partners like this um, to help address the challenges that we share. Next slide, please. This slide is probably no news to anyone who is in the region. You probably don't even need to read what is put on there to understand that we all together are facing um, these shared challenges, regardless of where you live throughout the Pacific. The PICAST, as I noted earlier, strives to actively listen to ongoing and evolving climate change uh, challenges identified by managers, as well as to understand the critical science gaps identified by scientists, which include our partners throughout the USGS, as well as academia, and further to understand the climate-related information that is needed by decision makers and educators across our region. These conversations and the relationships that this summit is part of forming those relationships, but the ongoing conversations and relationships help to inform the science agenda that PICAST pursues, which helps to inform the funding that we direct towards the region to address the needed management changes. This summit, as I noted just now, is an example of such a conversation. And I hope that as we move through this summit and as we move beyond that we will continue to engage with each other to move science in a more productive direction. Next slide, please. So while many of the themes may change, hopefully, as we uh, come up with solutions and we address them, um, the, what will not change, what will remain consistent across our efforts is the space in which PICAST works. So you can create your nice Venn diagram where you can understand that we do have ample scientific capacity that overlaps with resource management and with climate change. And similarly, we have resource management that is going to overlap but where all three meet is where we have this possibility of creating uh, adaptation efforts and creating adaptation efforts that are sustainable and that are just and that are equitable and that will last through the human generations to come as well as the ecosystems to come. So as partner organizations who have joined us today will focus their efforts on various portions of this figure, we all can come together in that middle portion where we can move adaptation forward. So again, this takes me back to the issue and you can move to the next slide, but it takes me back to the issue that none of us is going to solve this problem alone. We all are going to have to work together to bring our shared expertise to address our shared challenges. And I'm, I'm sure that I'm pretty much out of time now, even though Darren did an excellent job of stalling our break. Um, but, and I'm sure you've heard me repeat this before because I've repeated it a few times already, but I'm gonna say it again for the people who haven't heard it, who joined us late, for the people who need to hear it again, we have to work together. It's our connections that bind us together. Our ecosystems are connected from the terrestrial landscape to the reefs. We uh, are bound together by the oceans that connect us across the Pacific and the challenges that are affecting us across those oceans. So we need to seek to address these challenges together for, to learn from each other, to share um, the information that we can to be able to move this forward. And to that end, before I let go of the mic, um, I would like to thank the partners who you're about to hear from. You're about to hear from a number of individuals with whom I work who are, are really a truly amazing group of people who like many of you listening in the audience today are also committed to making a difference in the world and specifically in the Pacific. It is an honor truly to work with each of you towards your efforts to build fair, equitable, sustainable adaptation solutions. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Mary Vaughn. Um, next up, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Victoria Keener, who's a research fellow at the East-West Center and a lead PI of the Pacific Regional Integrated Sciences and Assessment, or RESA program. Victoria earned a PhD in agricultural and biological engineering from the University of Florida, specializing in hydroclimatological climatological research dealing with the effects of climate variability. Dr. Keener leads an interdisciplinary team of social and physical scientists that aims to reduce Pacific Islands' vulnerability to climate change by translating research into actionable knowledge for a variety of stakeholders at the local, state, and regional level. Thank you, Victoria. Take it away. Thank you, Brad. Um, and thanks, everyone, for including me in this, um, in this partner spotlight. Um, so I'm going to try and keep it 
brief, I just wanted to give an overview of the RISA, um, a little bit about uh, who we are, what we do, what we're about, and how we collaborate across the region and the kind of capabilities we provide. Um, so the Pacific RISA um, stands for the Regional Integrated Sciences and Assessments Program, a uh, very catchy acronym. Um, but we are, uh, we're not federal, we are a research grant program that is funded by NOAA. Um, and we are very interdisciplinary and we're very collaborative, as you can see by this uh, rainbow of logos flashing across your screen right now. Um, so although our core is located at the East West Center uh, in, in Honolulu, Hawaii, um, where I'm a research fellow and where we have a couple other people based, we're very collaborative and that many of our other PIs are located at the University of Hawaii, um, for example, at IPRC in the w, uh, WRC Water Resources Research Center, um, NREM. Um, so we have a lot of representation from across the university as well. And we collaborate um, upwards with, uh, with different federal groups. So examples include NOAA, of course, and a lot of the regional offices, um, the USGS, uh, the Pacific Islands um, Climate Adaptation Cli Center, Science Center, of course, um, and also at regional policy scale. So the city and county of Honolulu, um, for example. So I, I actually sit on the, um, the, the city climate change commission. Um, and so we, we have relationships at that level in terms of policy as well. Uh, forward slide, please. Um, so uh, what I view the Pacific RISA as is a climate boundary organization. Um, so we're a group of interdisciplinary climate scientists um, that try and bridge that gap between science and policy. Um, and so what a boundary organization really does is um, it presents, it, it presents a, a, an interface between the science world and the policy world. Um, and so it, it, it's a little bit confusing and the, the, the term doesn't have a single definition and doesn't come with a single method of um, implementing or guidance. Um, so it's really up to a lot of organizations to interpret if you want to be seen as um, uh, a boundary or organization. Um, but they're really a crucial link in generating both credible and trusted science that's relevant to local adaptation and mitigation decisions for climate change. Um, so these organizations serve as a link between researchers, community members, and policymakers in hopefully ways that are beneficial to all groups. Um, and as we go forward, you know, these are going to be increasingly critical types of organizations and facilitating solutions to different aspects of the climate crisis. Um, so the Pacific RISA, for example, acts as a boundary organization in the Hawaii and Pacific Islands region. Um, and we've been able to inform decision makers in different sectors, uh, helping them use decision uh, data in different decision makings. Um, one of uh, what you heard about today was the, the, the PERCA, the Pacific Islands Regional Climate um, Assessment um, reports that both uh, Xavier and Vanjie mentioned in their, um, in their talks. So we've been, um, uh, we help coordinate and staff that uh, Pacific Islands Regional Climate Assessment or PERCA project, but we really consider it to be a regional activity that's owned by no one group, which gives us resilience under um, something like an administrative change, for example. Um, forward, please. Um, so really, the, the, we see the boundary organization as being essential in generating and translating uh, research at the, the global scale into relevant management and policy outcomes um, at local and regional levels. Forward. Um, so just a bit about the National NOAA RISA program. So again, these are, um, these are research grants, not, uh, not federal. They're usually based at universities. Um, there are 11 programs uh, to date that have been um, offered across the United States. Um, in general, what they share is that they are five years long. Um, they're generally very flexible and they're all focused around use inspired climate research. Um, each RISA in a different region has um, a different focus, but commonalities include that they're all interdisciplinary um, in terms of how they approach climate science. Um, and they include stakeholders uh, from diverse sectors in the decision-making um, and the research process at all scales. Um, so some 
something you'll probably hear a lot during the rest of this uh, rest of this conference is some uh, about the co-production of research. So Risa's believe in that co-production process in which there's a continual dialogue between the researchers and the end users of the information to make sure it's useful and used. Um, the Reese's all have sustained relationships with stakeholders. Um, so continuing through that five years, um, we really try and build relationships that, that um, uh, create, um, uh, create us as a, as a trusted source of information for different sectors. And finally, we frame what we do in decision relevant context. Um, so while, um, while we do a lot of basic science, it's all framed in how it could be applied or how it is applied in decision context. Um, and I'll just finish up with our, um, our current team and some project themes that we have uh, going on right now. We're finishing up a five-year grant. Um, so we're at the tail end of it. Um, you might recommend, uh, recognize a lot of these faces um, uh, and probably we'll see them again throughout this conference, but some of our current projects include things like dynamical and statistical downscaling of climate models um, and the impacts those have on things like uh, climate extremes, um, groundwater, um, regional security. We also do things like watershed modeling and look at ecosystem services and, and um, natural resource economics. Uh, we do scenario planning, um, looking at land use changes and the different impacts on development and, um, and, and uh, uh, planning effects of that. Um, we also do state and territorial law and policy analysis. So we have um, a PI, uh, Maxine at the law school um, and we look at impacts of climate on human migration and human health throughout the region as well. Um, so as I said, again, we're very interdisciplinary. Uh, we work on projects with that interdisciplinary viewpoint. Um, and we've also been very active in um, uh, having a role in leading uh, the US national climate assessment chapters for the Hawaii and Pacific region. Um, and have worked very closely with the PICASC on that um, and on the PERCA products as we've gone forward. And I will stop there. Thanks. Great, thanks so much, Victoria. Thanks for being with us today. Um, just a quick reminder to everybody in our audience, um, please do send any questions for uh, the discussion part of this panel um, for any of our panelists uh, through the question and answer function in the webinar. Um, so next, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Tom Giambaluca, who's a professor with the Department of Geography and Environment and director of the Water Resources Research Center at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. His research focuses on climate variability, both spatial and temporal, including natural fluctuation and trends associated with global climate change, and looking at both past changes and projections of future changes, as well as interactions between the atmosphere and the land surface, including effects of land cover change on exchanges of water, carbon, and energy over terrestrial ecosystems. This includes effects on invasive plants, on ecosystem function, and hydrological processes in tropical montane cloud forests. So with that, please take it away, Tom. Thank you. Thanks very much, Brad. Um, aloha, everyone. I'm honored to be here with this group. and. Um, I'll just take a few minutes to talk about Water Resources Research Center, what we do um, <clears throat> and who we are. Next slide, please. So we are uh, one of the University of Hawaii's organized research units. We're a relatively small unit. Currently we have seven faculty, including myself um, and four permanent staff. Some of, of the, uh, the uh, members of the uh, center are shown here. So we're relatively small, but we are very active and we work on uh, a wide range of topics, uh, many of which are relevant to uh, the big questions around climate change. Obviously, water, fresh water and water resources, uh, you know, are one of the sectors that are really badly uh, impacted by climate change. And so uh, a lot of what we do is relevant to, to the issues being talked about today. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I should mention that Water Resources Research Center, uh, before talking about this slide, is one of 54 water research institutes uh, that are 
federally mandated and located in universities in the 50 states, Washington, D.C., uh, Guam, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. Uh, some of those centers, including ours, have more than one jurisdiction. So we, we have two. We, are, uh, we have Hawaii, obviously, as one of our jurisdictions. And we also have American Samoa as our other jurisdiction. So we're very interested in what's going on in water, the wide range of problems and research topics around water in Hawaii and American Samoa, but also uh, throughout the Pacific. So this slide shows uh, that, you know, how we do our work. First of all, the, the, uh, the circles kind of uh, summarize how all of our work is being done in some combination of these three uh, methods of field observations, laboratory analysis, and data analysis and modeling. Uh, and with those um, approaches, we cover a wide range of different uh, areas which are shown in the boxes there. I won't go through the, the list, but I just wanna um, you know, say that we do cover a wide range with a, a relatively small group. And, um, you know, and we're continuing to build on that, on our portfolio of, uh, of different research uh, projects and topics. Um, so before I go on, I wanna mention one, um, uh, I'm gonna mention a couple of uh, initiatives going on right now. One I don't have a slide for is called Work for Water. And it is uh, something that's being led by uh, Roger Babcock within, who is one of the faculty at Water Resources Research Center. And um, Stuart Coleman, who is uh, the head of a nonprofit called Y. And this, this particular initiative is, um, is ramping up a, uh, to, to address a very important problem in Hawaii, which is uh, our cesspools. So we have about 88,000 cesspools in Hawaii that are dumping something like 54 million gallons of untreated sewage into our groundwater and near coastal water every day. We have a law that mandates that we remove and replace all these cesspools by the year 2050, but we don't have a pathway to get there. So it's kind of a big unfunded mandate. So this project is a, a, an ambitious one to get us started on that important problem to, um, to address this issue of, of um, the cesspools in Hawaii and um, to build up the, the labor force and to overcome the technical problems, test solutions for alternatives, and ultimately to improve that area of infrastructure uh, as we move forward. That does have a strong climate change component because as sea level rises and, and water uh, flows are impacted by uh, changes in rainfall, we, uh, you know, this problem is, is, is getting worse. So uh, I'm gonna move on to the next slide. I talk a little, little bit about one other initiative that is uh, uh, ramping up within my own group at Water Resource Research Center. We cover uh, within that group a bunch of topics relevant here that are shown and some of the people in my lab are shown here. Next slide. Next. So one of the things we do is monitoring, which is obviously really important for uh, recognizing what's going on, you know, developing a baseline to be able to track climate change and its impacts um, and, um, and to give information that's relevant to adaptation and to mitigation as well. So we have been doing this kind of work for a long time. We, uh, we maintain several uh, networks across the state, including HollyNet, which is shown in the map in the lower left, uh, which uh, has been operating since 1988 and still operating today. One of the stations, uh, one of our remote stations is shown in the photo on the right. Next. Uh, and we uh, take data from HollyNet and our other networks and from all other sources available in the state to create products that are of use to uh, many interests in Hawaii. So the map one in the lower right is uh, from the Rainfall Atlas of Hawaii. And that's an online resource that has uh, downloadable maps and an interactive map. If you haven't already, please uh, uh, take a look at it. You can just Google Rainfall Atlas of Hawaii and you can find it easily. We also have uh, similar websites for evapotranspiration with maps of evapotranspiration, solar radiation, climate, including 
numerous climate variables. Uh, the thing that's in common about all these websites is these are mean maps or average maps. And so our recent work has been moving towards looking at the changes or the individual time periods rather than just the means. Next, please. So we're moving toward uh, near real-time climate mapping. So we've not only mapped all the historical uh, um, elements, all, all these elements through, through periods going back all the way to 1920, looking at monthly rainfall and temperature and so forth, but, and also doing daily rainfall maps for as many as 25 years in the past. We're moving to a system that automatically updates these maps at monthly and daily intervals. Next. And with that information, this high spatial resolution and relatively high temporal resolution at daily interval, we'll be able to uh, use that information to model important uh, processes and variables that can be used by resource managers and by those engaged in climate change adaptation, such as evapotranspiration, carbon exchange, carbon sequestration, uh, looking at soil moisture, which is important for irrigation, flood hazard and fire hazard, fuel moisture and so forth. Next. So we are in the process of building up something we call the Hawaii Climate Data and Monitoring Center. And the data side is diagrammed here. I won't go through all the details, but this is our automated um, method of ingesting data, quality controlling it, sort of screening it, uh, gap filling uh, data that were missing or were removed in the screening process and then interpolating those data to monthly and daily maps and then publishing them on um, automatically on our uh, data portal. Next slide. So when we do that, of course, the products are only as good as the, um, as the monitoring network that we have. So another arm of our effort is to build out a statewide climate monitoring uh, network that supplements the existing stations so we're going to call this the Hawaii Mesonet. We plan to install 100 new stations with a complete array of sensors, not just rainfall, and have all those stations be telemetered for real-time data availability to be able to produce near real-time products. So this is something we're working hard on right now. And um, you know, it's one of the, the big efforts we're making at the moment. So that's all I have for today. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks very much. Great. Thanks, Tom. We'll come to back to the questions uh, after everybody's had a chance to do their opening uh, talk address here. Um, next, it's my pleasure to introduce and, and thank Katie Steele, uh, Dr. Katie Steele, for joining us. She's the coordinator and deputy director of the USDA Southwest Climate Hub. She's primarily responsible for stakeholder outreach and regional and national partnerships. She's a geographer by trade with expertise in remote sensing, geographical information systems, and climate impact on cropland agricultural, agriculture and rangeland. She's particularly interested in how climate adaptation priorities vary across the Southwest region and how socioeconomic factors affect farmers and ranchers' adaptive capacity. Thanks again for being with us, Katie. Take it away, please. Thanks, Brad. Yes, as Brad mentioned, I'm the coordinator of the USDA Southwest, Southwest Climate Hub. And to show you this first slide here, there are 10 climate hub regions across the US and these were founded in 2014 under Secretary Vilsack. So it's a USDA initiative. And the mission of the climate hubs is to develop and deliver science-based region specific information and technologies to agricultural and natural resource managers. And this is specifically with a view to enabling climate informed decision-making. And our Southwest region is quite large. We serve Hawaii and the Pacific Islands and the four driest mainland states, New Mexico, Nevada, Arizona, and Utah. So at the Southwest hub, we've actually got a very small core team of three people, but we have a very broad portfolio of work that's related to agriculture, forests, and communities. And this is made possible because we collaborate with many, many folks. And that includes extension, federal and state agencies, nonprofits, and other boundary organizations. Um, I wanted to focus today on adaptation and some recent work that we've started because we've just recently become involved in the more applied side of adaptation. 
And this has been made possible with the partnership with the Northern Forest Climate Hub, and um, which coexists in the same location with the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science or NIACS. And so specifically, I'm gonna to talk to you today about the adaptation workbook process that they've developed, but we are now using in our region. And the reason I wanted to focus on that is because I think it's perhaps the most relevant project for this meeting, but do bear in mind, we've got a really big portfolio of projects and we're always looking for partners to, to collaborate with. So next slide, please. So um, we know that natural resource managers face the challenge of incorporating climate change adaptation strategies into their on the ground management decisions and actions. And the big question that managers are trying to answer is what actions can be taken to enhance the ability of a system to cope with change and still meet management goals and objectives. Next slide. So we can do this by considering adaptation options that help us identify and implement actions that are robust across a range of potential future conditions. And so these adaptation options start from resistance where we're thinking about reducing impacts and maintaining current conditions to resilience where we are accommodating some degree of change and bouncing back from disturbances to transition where we're intentionally facilitating change and enabling ecosystems or agro ecosystems or hydrological systems, whatever kind of system to respond to new and changing conditions. Next slide, please. So all of these adaptation options are incorporated into a process called the adaptation workbook. And this is illustrated on this slide here. The adaptation workbook is an adaptive management framework where your, uh, the user can walk through a series of five steps to integrate climate change considerations into management planning and on the ground actions. So at step one, we start by identifying the location and management goals and objectives, asking what do we value about the resources we're managing for? Then at step two, we move into assessing the specific climate impacts to and vulnerabilities of the resource and our specific location or project area. So this is where the work that uh, Professor Jean Beluca and Victoria Kino and the PyCast folks comes in very useful. So when we pull in these vulnerability assessments, scientific literature, and also, of course, not forgetting traditional knowledge, then we build up a bigger picture of what we can expect to happen to our resources in the future. At step three, we reevaluate our management goals based on those expected climate change impacts. And here we ask, do our management goals and objectives still make sense given the climate change impacts that we're gonna see in the future. Then we move to step four, if step three is, um, is a positive. And at step four, we identify and implement our adaptation actions or tactics. And here we do this by bringing in tools called adaptation menus. And these are very particular to the kind of resource you're managing. So the adapt adaptation menus allow us to choose strategies that make the most sense for the resource we're managing and for our goals and objectives. And I think it's worth mentioning here too that the menus are tuned to the system that we're working with. So although the adaptation workbook was originally developed for managers in northern hardwood forests, they, um, we've been developing adaptation menus for any resource that where adaptation actions can be considered appropriate. Um, and at step five, we wrap up the process. Well, that's kind of the wrong word, but we uh, continue the process by monitoring the actions that we've selected and the strategies that we've chosen to see if they're gonna be effective into the future. And if they're not, then we go back through the process again. So it's a constant consideration of what's gonna be effective and monitoring to, to make sure it, of its effectiveness. Next slide, please. So uh, I just wanted to highlight this uh, course that's coming up in January. The Southwest Hub, NIACS, and partners in Hawaii will be walking through the five-step process as part of a course that's going to be offered in January through March 2021. And this is for managers working in Hawaii. 
Um, it's an eight week online course with weekly lectures, uh, online discussions, coaching sessions where we're going to look at climate change impacts, challenges and opportunities and discuss developing specific actions that will help adapt ecosystems or other systems to changing conditions. And this is where we are working with a whole bunch of um, partners, you can see the partners along the bottom. And I also wanted to draw your attention to the local planning team in case you've got questions that I can't answer. And that's Christian Jardina, Abby Frazier, Ryan Longman, Elliot Parsons, Heather Kirkring, Darcy Yogi, and Katie Camilla Mela. And my name's Katie Steele, Katie at NMSU. If you have more questions about the course uh, that we don't answer today, please um, hit me up. And thank you to Courtney Peterson from NIAX for helping me prepare the slides. That's it, thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Katie, for joining us during your evening in the Western continent. Very much it's appreciated. A bit, a bit dark here. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, next we're gonna move to Dr. Kavika Winter. Uh, Kavika is a reserve manager at the Heia National Estuarine Research Reserve and is a faculty member at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Bio Biology. He's a multidisciplinary ecologist who has focused his research and professional career on large-scale biocultural restoration of social ecological systems in Hawaii. His particular areas of interest include revival of traditional resource management, and he operates in the spheres of academia, conservation, and policy. Um, and Kavika has uh, taken the admirable approach, one I always find brave, not using any slides. So we'll hand it over to you, Kavika. Um, go ahead, thank you for being with us. Thanks, so I thought I'd uh, open up with some interpretive dance instead. No, I'm just joking. So um, yeah, I don't have any pretty slides for you guys. I apologize for that. Um, but I am happy to join you guys and share a little bit about the Heia National Estuarine Research Reserve. For those of you who don't know, the uh, NERS system is a nationwide system that's operated through the Office of Coastal Management through at NOAA. And it's always done in partnership with a different state agency in Hawaii. The state agency is actually University of Hawaii at Manoa. And so UH administers the program through the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology, where I'm a faculty member. Uh, we've been in, in existence since 2017. Um, actually, we were signed, we were designated and signed into existence on uh, President Obama's last day in office. Uh, I joked that it was the last paper that he signed as he walked out the door. Um, but anyway, yeah, we've been uh, on the ground uh, trying to figure out how we're going to be a reserve. We, we are, we had a very unique uh, process in the designation, uh, designation process. Most of the other reserves around the nation, the other 28, um, they were basically designated through an agency driven process. And in Hawaii, it was a different scenario, it was a community driven process that led to the designation. It was all the way back in 1992. It actually even started before that is the community of Heia and on the windward side of Oahu and Ko'olaupoko uh, started to self-organize and try and figure out how they're going to restore Kanuhe Bay after the decades of uh, sewage that was being dumped in there and the collapse of the coral reefs and the, and the, and the health of the coral reefs. And, and they worked on a, a comprehensive management plan for Kanuhe Bay that finally got published in 1992. And one of the recommendations of that plan all the way back in 1992 was to establish a National Estuarine Research Reserve um, to bring in some federal funding and help the community to uh, restore Kanuhe Bay and to do, do the research needed to inform the restoration process. So jumping forward a few, two decades, two and a half decades, uh, the community got together again and saw an opportunity to push it through under the uh, Obama administration and, and got it done and the staff was hired in the summer of 2018 so we're a relatively new staff uh, all things considered and we spent the last uh, two years really trying to hone in on articulating what we're doing how we're doing it and we're focused we're really focused in on trying to understand the the ecological um, ramifications of uh, restoring things using indigenous resource management. So you generally have two ways of doing conservation. You have um, 
uh, conventional way that is informed by conservation biology and other sciences and you have certain outcomes that are associated with that and then you have indigenous resource management strategies and certain out outcomes that come with that so we're looking at two different approaches uh, to uh, conservation biology restoration ecology and, and seeing what happens when you do the indigenous approach so in the process of doing all that we, we have really have an amazing opportunity to build out the notion of, uh, or build out an understanding of indigenous science. And, you know, 20 years ago, when I was a young graduate student, the, the notion of Hawaiian science or indigenous science was laughable in many circles. I think we've come a long way since then. And so we're, we're now at a point where we're really co-producing uh, new knowledge between using indigenous science and conventional science. Uh, and the uh, Heia Nurs is a great, place to look at that question. It's also um, another place where we're looking at ecosystem based management, which is, you know, managing on a system level and including people in, in, the, in the system, not excluding people with arbitrary boundaries and, and seeing if we can restore some kind of uh, notion of a pristine nature, which is really a foreign concept in Hawaii. And so um, with our research program, we're, we're collaborating with uh, researchers all over UH. There's actually more than a dozen labs at UH who are actively conducting research in Heia. And so we've recently brought every, all the research together with the community leaders, the kupuna, the Hawaiian elders, um, a bunch of researchers out at Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology. And we recently published a concept paper. It was actually published last Friday that articulates how we're gonna conduct research. And the title of the paper is Collaborative Research to Inform Adaptive Co-Management. Uh, so co-management being uh, uh, short for collaborative management or how to manage resources uh, between communities and agent government agencies, how, how communities and government agencies can work together uh, utilizing the, the mandate that government has to uh, Manage resources as well as the uh, indigenous and local knowledge that is possessed in communities and the passion that's uh, possessed in communities and harnessing both of those to really achieve some some greater results. So that's a rough overview of what we do and how we do it in, he in Heia and I'm happy to answer some questions at any point, but I'll turn it back over to Brad. Excellent. Thanks so much, Kavika for being with us. Um, we'll get to the questions in a little bit, um, but I have one more person to introduce. Uh, my director and boss, Dr. Darren Lerner, um, serves as the director of the University of Hawaii Sea Grant College Program and university, and serves as the university consortium director for PyTask. Dr. Lerner's academic background focuses on the environmental physiology of fishes and the effects of environmental contaminants on animal physiology and behavior. He has over has more than 50 publications and peer reviewed journals covering these topics, as well as focus on water resources and STEM education. Go ahead, Darren. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Um, and as Brad just introduced me, I've, I've been asked in this partners panel to um, to speak about Sea Grant. But of course, in, in the last three to four years, I've I've uh, I firmly have wear two hats, and that is one with Sea Grant and one with uh, PyCask. So you're going to hear a little bit of both from me in this presentation. Um, so Sea uh, Grant, first, of course, um, if you're not familiar, we are one of 34 Sea Grant College programs around. Uh, the United States, it's all coastal states, the Great Lakes, Puerto Rico, Guam. Um, and um, our mission broadly is to focus on the enhancement and balance of the practical use and conservation of coastal and marine resources. Um, the goal is to create sustainable and resilient economies and environments. A little bit about where we work. Uh, of course, we work in Hawaii, but we also have uh, somebody used the term earlier about an unfunded mandate. <laughs> we are proud and we embrace the unfunded mandate to work across the Pacific and highlighted here in this slide are some of the areas in which we do so. And you'll see in a moment where we have some faculty located. 
Um, every four years, we develop a strategic plan, and in that strategic plan, we uh, align focus areas with that of our sister programs across the U.S. and with our national office. Um, currently, and in fact, for the last couple of cycles, we focus here on protecting, enhancing, and restoring habitats, preparing and adapting to changing conditions, supporting a safe, sustainable seafood supply, and supporting and training a diverse workforce. Uh, cutting across all of those are uh, several cross-cutting themes aptly named, uh, and they include climate change impacts and adaptation, and hopefully that's fairly obvious as one of the big connectors to our role with PyCask. Uh, also increasing sustainability and resilience, integrating knowledge systems, and justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And then we have a number of functional areas in which uh, we work or activities, if you will, in which we engage. Um, one of them is research. I'll tell you a little more in depth about the competitive research program in which we conduct. Another is extension. And just like our land grant um, partners, in fact, ancestors, if you will, Sea Grant was stood up um, to, to be very similar to land grant in that way and have extension services and people, faculty in this case, who focus on extension. And of course, we're engaged in education. Unlike many of the programs, or I should say academic units on the university campus, much of our education is what is referred to as informal, but we engage in some formal education on the campus as well. And then what good really would it be if we did all of these things, but we didn't tell anybody about it. And so we have a great uh, communications team and we have a lot of focus on communicating uh, the things we do, the research that not only we do, but that all the folks that we engage conduct um, and bring that all together. And speaking about bringing it all together, I think to emphasize is what we really look to is to do all of these things uh, when we're focusing on particular projects and in particular areas or in partnership with others. And it's really when we do bring all of them together where we have that sweet spot right there in the middle. A little, just a touch uh, more on research. Uh, you know, it's focused on informed decision-making. So it's actionable science that we focus on. Uh, and as I mentioned, responsible use and conservation of coastal research sources. Um, we do issue every other year a, um, a request for proposals. In fact, the next one is coming out here in early December. I believe we're targeting December 7th. Don't hold me to that. We might need a day or two of wiggle room. Uh, they're two-year projects. Uh, we ask researchers to propose things that, of course, focus in our focus areas and, and our cross-cutting themes. In the past and to date, the typical award has been around 35,000 a year. However, we're coming out with some new opportunities. We're gonna have a, um, an individual opportunity focused on aquaculture. And then we're looking to really emphasize interdisciplinary proposals and we'll kind of raise the ceiling, if you will, for those kinds of opportunities where we look for instance, or for example, to bring uh, physical and natural and social sciences together on a project. Uh, all of our research is, is very much focused on, C, uh, excuse me, on graduate students and their success. Uh, and we have a C Grant graduate fellowship program that uh, brings graduate students on with each of the funded projects. And then we include outreach and transfer results to stakeholders in each one of these uh, projects. A uh, little bit on extension, you're all probably relatively uh, familiar but to cover the base, uh, our extension faculty live, work, and play in the communities that they serve. And they're there not only to bring the results of research from the university and our partners outside of the university, but also to bring to us what those community needs are, to really understand those community needs and work with communities and stakeholders and people across the region to understand what those needs are so that we can better focus on them. Uh, our extension faculty, as I mentioned, uh, work all over our region, Hawaii and the US API, uh, quite a number. The bulk are located here on Oahu. And we have two individuals now on Maui. 
two uh, based on Hawaii Island, four based out of Kauai, and our three folks that um, are in the Pacific, two of those three have been prevented from going home to the Pacific since March because of COVID, but we'll get them back there soon. And even though these are based in certain areas, it doesn't mean that any, and if not all of them work across the state and the region as needed. Um, just a couple of examples, because we have a wide array of different education activities, but I think two to point out, and hopefully you're familiar, one is our Voice of the Sea, which is um, our TV series, uh, documentary series uh, focused on marine science, and we're airing all over the Pacific in Hawaii, American Samoa, Guam, and Palau, the FSM and the RMI. And uh, many, at least here in Hawaii, of course, are familiar with our Hanama Bay Education Program. More than 30 years, it's been established with a strong partnership with the city and county of Honolulu and includes volunteer programs and community services and other activities. And as I mentioned, communications, and again, this is just the, the tip of the iceberg, but I wanted to just have a nice pictures up here to show you some of the publications that we've been working on. And they, they range from uh, regular uh, kind of uh, investigative news magazine, uh, Kapili Kai, uh, to various books uh, focused in various areas like Hawaiian reef plants and fishes, uh, to children's books like the Three Io Brothers and the Big Bad Hurricane. Uh, keep your eyes open, we're working on the second in that series. So I'm gonna shift here um, uh, before Brad tries to pull out the hook on me because, um, you know, as, as Mary Vaughn um, mentioned earlier, this meeting is not about PyCast per se. This meeting uh, really is to emphasize and recognize that it really does take all of us working together uh, to bring integrated approaches to the solutions for this crime, climate crisis. And I know we've all been enveloped in, uh, in the day-to-day -day of COVID. And I don't mean to, to diminish the importance of that or the now 250,000 or approaching 50,000 people in the United States that have died. But we're gonna have vaccines and we're gonna be taking care of COVID. And again, not to diminish those lives, but the climate crisis is worse. I'm, I'm willing to argue with any, anybody about that. And I bet many people here would agree. Um, and that's really what this is a first in a series that we look to put together to bring people together and, and develop partnership. That said, we haven't told you uh, too much about what our PyCast is in terms of how our consortium side anyways is put together. So that's that here. Um, you've heard from Mary Vaughn. She's our federal partner and the federal director uh, and is a USGS employee. We have a university consortium. I serve as that university director, as mentioned. I don't think it's been mentioned that Brad serves as our university deputy director. And then we have co-leads in our other uh, university consortium members, which is at the University of Hawaii at Hilo with Dr. Jim Beats and the University of Guam with Dr. Romina King. Uh, and as you heard earlier, there were a few people that uh, really couldn't make their presentation without mentioning Romina and the University of Guam and the activities there. At the very heart of why these two programs are working so closely together, uh, certainly from my perspective, but shared by some others, fortunately, which is why we got funded, um, is that we both seek to connect the federal, state, and local government, industry, and community to the university enterprise. And fortunately, we have a lot of interconnectivity here uh, across our regions in which we work. And of course, PyCask works across the uh, US affiliated Pacific Islands in Hawaii, as does Sea Grant. And then we have connectivity here with our focus areas. And sorry that blanked it out so quick, but uh, PyCask is working off of our last five-year um, uh, science uh, themes, and uh, more than half of them have great connectivity. Those are the ones I've left here in yellow for you with the focus areas in Sea Grant. And so it made a lot of sense as we were moving forward to look for potential, I'll steal my own thunder, but potential synergies. 
And then the last slide that, or second to last slide that I'll cover here is that both are really committed to um, co-production uh, and, and really a, a diverse range of activities that include co-production and include things like ex formal extension uh, and a whole host of other activities along that. Uh, and this is just a kind of uh, an example here on the right-hand side, Kulana Noi, that uh, C grant with, um, with a, a, a large number of uh, partners, um, including Kua here in Hawaii, and now working closely with PyCasks, have developed as guidance for researchers in working with communities and stakeholders. And really the, the as I said, I stole my thunder on this synergy and I think I can't emphasize enough that not only the discussions we're having here and I hope that people are pulling from the conversations that we've heard and that we will hear, hear over the next day, um, but the partnership is so incredibly important uh, when we're looking for these opportunities for synergistic outcomes. Uh, just like, and I know Scott Larson's out there, so he's gonna appreciate this picture of this outrigger canoe because it can't get done without partnership. Thank you very much for your attention. All right, mahalo Darren.